Hello again, YouTube. This is Patrick, and that's Abigail, and it's after work. Uh, it's about uh, 8 o'clock at night on Friday night, and uh, tomorrow will be my first actual weekend off in, uh, in quite a long time, now that I'm doing the regular uh, 8 to 4, 5 days a week, regular day job, like a regular human being. That is uh, some pretty exciting stuff. We just got back from the rehearsal for uh, our brother's wedding, and um, it was like maybe uh, you know 15 minutes of running over some quick choreography, and then out for dinner and drinks. Uh, I had I had coffee black because I've got a bunch of charting to do. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, this is going to be my first week with uh, my own caseload of my very own and. Uh, it is really definitely definitely a different experience because you know like when when I go and I see somebody I know that if something didn't work out quite right I'm the one that they're going to call <laughs> not one of the other nurses so um, it's uh, definitely a new challenge and trying to be consistent and planning uh, planning in the longer range you know like what's gonna happen next week and the week after uh, when do I have to visit next I don't have somebody telling me well, today you're going to visit this person and this person. I have to like figure all that stuff out on my own and like make up my schedule and stuff. So now I'm very thankful that I have the weekends off because I, I can now figure that out on the weekends and uh, not uh, not you know scramble and try to do it uh, at work. I got a I got a call like two hours after the end of my shift from a family member, one of my patients, because you know the patient wasn't doing very well and you know condition is changing and stuff and. Um, I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me to say, well, you know, I'm off shift right now, you should really call the on-call. Uh, it, you know, I just, just you know, talked to the guy through what was going on and explained what was going to happen next and, you know, gave uh, whatever useful advice I thought was reasonable to give at the time. And uh, I, I really don't mind uh, being called after hours. I'm using my own phone, I don't call or ID block myself when I call out, um, which I guess I'm technically supposed to do for, like, professional boundary reasons. Um, but um, I, that, that is not something that I've been doing. Maybe, maybe I should. Yeah, that guy's flashing his brace at me. I don't know why. Huh. Well, as long as it's not a cop. Maybe I'll just turn this thing off. Ha! Now you can't see me. <laughs> just on the off chance it was a cop and he doesn't like me having my light on. You're now the invisible RN. Yes, I'm the invisible nurse. Oh, today Patrick got a nursing knife? I did get a nursing knife. Uh, let's see if I can find it. And my brother gave me this, uh, gave all of his groomsmen presents, and it's a, uh, it's a knife. Uh, you can't see it; it's too dark. But uh, it's one of those, um, it's one of those fold-out knives, knives, you know, with the, with the spring, uh, the spring lock on it. And uh, it has uh, uh, engraved on it. It has PMRN, which is the, the handle that I use uh, pretty much everywhere. So yeah, that was a very thoughtful gift. Now I'm gonna have to try to remember to get him something. Um, like orders, so I'll have something shipped to his house, maybe. Uh, I've just been too busy to go gift shopping lately, you know, just running around. I ordered him an embarrassing book. Well, not that embarrassing, I guess. Well, useful. Oh, it works, for, it works for mom. Yeah, and they plan to reproduce. I checked beforehand. The book that she's referring to is a manual on how to uh, predetermine the gender of your uh, offspring through uh, reproductive cycles. And uh, it works, and you, we know that it works because farmers use it on farm animals. Uh, so it's. Um, and our mother used it on us. Yes, yes. We are the product of genetic as well as sociological engineering, and uh, we have we have a proud tradition of sociological engineering. Look upon us, ye mighty, and the and despair, or something. Yeah. So I learned something very interesting about myself today. My sister told an amusing anecdote uh, about myself uh, that I, I wasn't aware of. Uh, why don't you go ahead and tell it, Abigail? Okay. Well, when Patrick was an adorable little preschool student, he wanted to go to a preschool with um, computers, and or a nursing school with computers. So he went into the Yellow Pages and he found a nursing school that had computers. A nursing school, that's where I got my degree. You mean a, a preschool, right? A preschool. A yeah. nursery school. A nursery school, yeah. A nursery school. Nursing school, nursery school, it's all the same. Whatever. Anyway, um, so 
the, com the only computers were in a room where you had to be potty trained to go in. And Patrick wasn't potty trained yet by that point. So he just turned to mom and said, okay, I'll be potty trained by tomorrow. And then the next day, he was potty trained. He'd just been holding out on her for his own nefarious purposes. And computers were the proper incentive for him to learn how to control his bladder. And he was like, I don't know, three or four or something ridiculous. Yeah, development's better, uh, different for everybody, I guess. Different. I did say different, right? Development is different for everyone. That's I what, believe that's what you said. That, that's what I meant to say. I yeah. believe that's what you said twice. Uh, we, we can check the recording later. <laughs> Berate you for misspeaking. Yeah. So on Monday, my seven-person caseload will be a ten-person caseload. Are you going up to twelve? Eventually, I think I am going up to twelve, yeah. But, I mean, they're, start, they're starting me off easy. That's very nice of them. They're, they're easing me into it. Which is exactly what I would expect uh, intelligent and compassionate supervisors to do. Uh, and I finally, for the first time, feel like... You have them? I am yeah, being managed by intelligent and compassionate people. So, that's, uh, that's a good thing. It's, uh, it bodes well. It bodes well for this chapter in my career. Okay, now you've jinxed it, Pat. Congratulations. Well, you know. <laughs> It does, it bones, it bones well. It definitely bones well. I just like doing that. So I met a couple of patients that were new on my caseload. They'd just been admitted today and they both, you know, kind of felt that they were doing all right and they didn't really need a visit right away. So I saw them at the end of the week and uh, they were both really cool and we got, hit it off really well. And, went over what all their concerns were, what their big priorities were, and uh, I feel like uh, like it went very well. And it's, it's really, like, it's totally a different experience because I'm going to be their case manager, and unless, you know, circumstances change, I mean, sometimes things change or whatever, people move around or, or whatever, but in all likelihood, I will be their RN case manager for the rest of their disease process. And that's... Uh, that's uh, pretty heavy, you know, like I'm going to be the guy uh, responsible for making sure all this shit uh, turns out well. And um, that's uh, a co completely different approach, like in the moment while I'm there sitting with them. I'm thinking about it differently. So, you know, causes me to uh, form my lines of inquiry uh, a little bit differently, but they all just sort of naturally evolve from conversation anyway. Um, I think people tend to be a lot more open if you're just, you know, having a conversation with them instead of, like, quizzing them on things. Which I have to do sometimes. I do occasionally have to quiz people on things, but... Going down the checklist. Going down the checklist. Usually, uh, usually the checklist are, like, the first, like, few things that I'll rattle off, uh, whether I know the person already or I don't know the person or, or, or whatever, is, do you have any pain? Are you short of breath at all? Have you been nauseous lately? Have you been dizzy at all? And then usually from there I'll like branch out into other questions like how have you been sleeping and you know like I try to get as much info after that about like what their usual day entails or has entailed lately. What's but, your favorite subgenre of science fiction? The important questions. Yeah, well, you usually don't jump into that right away. Uh, uh, it is a delicate question. You want to prepare the ground. Yeah. But, you know, through conversations like this, you can, like, really organically extract all the relevant comprehensive head-to-toe info about everything about their, you know, sleep and rest patterns, their nutrition patterns, their symptoms, what they think about their symptoms, what their symptoms mean to them, you know, what their concerns are, and what their functional limitations are. And, uh, you can really, uh, you can really get, get inside somebody's head pretty good in uh, 30, 40 minutes. Uh, and it's important to collect all this information and record it somewhere, not just uh, for my own knowledge, but for the rest of the interdisciplinary team too, you know? And some of it might be of interest to a doctor or a social worker or somebody like that. I've got like a billion things in the back of my mind I gotta remember to communicate because I left from, well, I finished my last visit of the day and then I went straight to the wedding re rehearsal and now I need to chart. So when I step through, it's like very weird, like, I couldn't, like, just recall them all declaratively right now and just, like, like talk through all of it. But when I sit down and look at the charting and, like, you know, kind of 
feel my way through it, I'll suddenly, in doing that process, I will suddenly remember, oh, I need to send an email to this person about that, you know? Well, there's a lot to juggle around in my brain at the same time. It's pretty manageable right now. We'll see how it goes when there's more patience. But I definitely, I find myself getting more organized uh, without being prompted, and that's a very weird and unusual thing to me because I tend to be an intentionally disorganized person. It's intentional? All these years it's been intentional? Yeah, it's been intentional, yeah. So I'm starting to use, uh, I mentioned a little bit about this yesterday, I'm starting to use, uh, you know, things like um, Outlook, you know, and like the Microsoft Office suite. Uh, not because it's like a chore and I'm being forced to do it, but because I legitimately need to use these tools to keep myself organized. And they're like helpful to me. Uh, like uh, the calendar feature in Outlook, I'm using it to like schedule when my port flushes are due or you know, when I'm due to supervise one of the home health aides or like all this other stuff that I have to remember to do. And uh, when I, because I have my, my company email on my phone, whenever I update the Outlook calendar, it automatically populates my phone with those to-do list items. Oh, I remember you saying that. Yes, yes, very interesting. And that calendar interface works exactly like the scheduling interface in our charting software, except it works correctly. <laughs> it's like they, they, they ripped off the user interface from Outlook Calendar, but they did it in a very like sloppy and incomplete way. So when I used the Outlook Calendar for the first time, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is just like our scheduler, but it actually works right. Wow. This is what they meant to do. Yeah. But unfortunately, Outlook as it is, you know, you can't incorporate it into a, you know, a HIPAA-compliant uh, healthcare informatics system, I guess. I'm sure there's a way to do it, but the, the charting tool that we use has all of those features, like, built in to protect uh, confidentiality. client... Confidentiality. Yeah, patient confidentiality and stuff like that. And the, the quality manager, you know, and the compliance officer came by my cubicle. I'm getting a cubicle desk now. I'm getting my own little you cubicle. You have a cubicle? That's so exciting. Well, it's more like a cubby. There's like these uh, four little mini stubs of a hallway that have uh, like five little, uh, that have like five desks on each side. So there's like, I don't think it's even five. I think it's like four. But will you so, be able to decorate your cubby and keep snacks in it? Well, you know, that's what I'm wondering because the nurse whose desk I'm taking is out on maternity leave right now. So I don't really want to settle in if I'm just going to have to clear back out again when she comes back from maternity leave, so I will ask my supervisor that question. I don't think she really cares which desk she has. Um, but I mean, I don't want to, I mean, I would definitely like offer her her spot back when she came back, you know. She'd been there longer than me and I got a lot of respect for her, you know, she's a pretty cool nurse. All, all of us. All of my coworkers were telling and retelling stories about her labor and delivery of her uh, child uh, around the office. They're like, uh, I, I, can, I can do without this first thing in the morning. I don't need to hear all the gory details about her labor and delivery, please. Which probably just made them enjoy grossing you out more. Because I know that's the effect it would have on me. Yeah, I mean, I was overhearing them from like, you know, uh, Oh, from a, you know, around a wall, you know, they, were, oh, okay. they weren't, like, actually present. I mean, I appreciate their, I, I appreciate and understand their enthusiasm, since they're all, like, on average 45-year-old white women, I understand. Babies are sort of a big demographic thing. Yeah, babies are things that they, they like to think about. says that she's switched back to the way she was before having children and now she doesn't like children at all. Huh. Well, she decided not to be a teacher after getting her teaching license because she realized she didn't like children who aren't her own. Yeah, she told me she considered being a nurse at one point, too. Hmm. Well, she was really good at the sciences, so I can see how that would come up. Well, I told her not to discount getting into the nursing profession. Some of my classmates were her age when I went to school. Hmm. I guess I can't see mom really enjoying it because she tends to prefer solitary pursuits and there's a lot of human interaction in nursing. Depends on what kind of nursing. Hmm. I guess that's true. I mean, she's been doing like, um, uh, you know, like uh, desktop publishing and technical writing and there's a whole nursing informatics field that's, you know, brand new. I think there's under a thousand uh, licensed nurse informaticists 
uh, in the country. So I, I think I mean, maybe that was what the figure was a few years ago when I had heard it. I don't, I don't know maybe if that's true. maybe she could design some software that wouldn't have you tearing your hair out. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I guess not all of them are, not all nurse informaticists are in development, but uh -huh. some of them like um, maintain and administer large health info systems. So I guess it's kind of like being a systems administrator, but it's like a, a lower layer of system administration where it's just dealing with the uh, the health info systems and not the backbone infrastructure of the communication system itself, you know? Uh -huh. Because like a systems admin would be able to keep the system working, but without the without the medical training, they wouldn't necessarily understand uh, why it was important or how people were going to use it or, or what the yeah. effects of different changes would be. What was meaningful and needed to be kept, what was noise or just leftover stuff that didn't need to be saved. Yeah. yeah. Wait, how, how did I... How did I get in the wrong lane again? How did that happen? <laughs> I thought I switched to the right lane. I guess you were just distracted. Yeah, I guess so. By the prospect of software you could stand. Yes. In the nursing profession. I had a really funny moment laughing with one of the nurses I really look up to at work. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, when I was visiting yesterday one of her patients to switch him over to the hospice benefit. And uh, she mentioned not being able to stand him. And I, I didn't really know what she meant, uh, but she was talking about standing him up. I'm like, oh, I thought you just meant you were fed up with him. <laughs> and we laughed and laughed. And why are these cars going so slow? There we go. Because they're busy laughing and laughing with <laughs> nurses they really respect. Yeah. And it slows you down. Mm. On, uh, we're back on our home stretch. Oh, excellent. So you can get to that all important charting. Yeah, so I can get back to work. <laughs> yeah, so I definitely got to start using that uh, MiFi card and start charting during the day. I'm going to start doing that this next week. So it doesn't all pile up for the evening? Yeah, I mean, it's been manageable and I haven't really minded doing it, but um, I, should, I should really get it done during the work day. Well, you can do extra charting during the evening or Yeah, something. right, yeah, I'll have time for more charting, yeah. I mean, right now I've got, I'm backed up on something. There was a, a discharge, there was discharge documentation I didn't realize I was supposed to do, so now it's a few days overdue. Mm. And I told my boss I'd get it done tonight, but she's like, no, do it next week, enjoy the wedding, that's fine. So that was nice of her. Oh, yeah. Probably because she doesn't know you hate weddings. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I'd mention that to her, no. Oh, okay. I like talking to Melissa's dad. Yeah, he seems like a nice guy. Yeah, he had talked much to me before and he just seemed sort of quiet, but I guess you just have to engage him in subjects he's interested in. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people are probably like that. Well, I get along great with engineering types. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I have much of the requisite background. Mm. <coughs> well, it was nice to connect with somebody in her family. Family dynamic was pretty interesting, don't you think? Yeah, pretty interesting. Mm. Too bad that sister is 16, though, man. <laughs> no one's 16 forever. That's true. Yeah, so I don't think I'm going to go to that Halloween party tonight. I'm just going to drop you off, that's alright. Yeah, that's fine. 
I'm going to spend my Halloween at the doctor's office. Ooh. Yes. Receiving necessary medical care. Yeah. The scariest thing of all. Yeah. Well, I mentioned to a couple of my friends that I was on health insurance for the first time, and they said, well, how does it feel to be on health insurance for the first time in five years? I'm like, well, I don't know yet. Let me tell you, after I've gotten all the invasive procedures, I'm going to sign up for it. Yeah, you're due for colonoscopy, right? Yeah, endoscopy, yeah. I'm glad I'm not 30, because that sounds unpleasant. No, it's not that bad. They give you good drugs. Oh, well, I mean, if the drugs are good. Yeah. Well, you know, I picked up mom after hers, and she was fine. You know, they, yeah. they really have some conscious sedation down to an art form. Mom is or, made of tougher stuff or than me. Or down to a science, I should say. Yeah, I've actually been, like, you know, actually considering for the first time what it would be like to get these procedures that so many of my patients have had, and uh, it's pretty intimidating. Hmm. Well, maybe having had a few of them will give you clinical insight. Yeah, yeah. You can think of it as work-related. Yeah. Well, I don't plan to work in operating room or post-anesthesia recovery. Yeah. I do intend... But it's to, still tangentially related. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I intend to advocate for myself to the point where the nurses will rapidly become sick of me, I'm sure. <laughs> it's like, um, excuse me, it's been two and a half hours since I've been repositioned. Don't you think I should be repositioned now? Uh, but I, I heard that doctors are the worst patients, but maybe you'll prove them wrong that it's nurses who are. Yeah. Maybe there's a... Backseat nursing? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, maybe with uh, some of the nurses that are patients now, maybe they don't speak up because they don't want to bother the busy nurses and they're just stoic or something. Mm. Well, that would be too bad. I don't know. I've had plenty of nurses as patients when I worked in the nursing home, and they, yeah. they weren't, as a, as a group, they weren't really significantly different from people at large. So the real difference will be that you're Patrick. Yeah, that will, that will be the real difference. Although, you know, one patient I had in clinicals when I was a nursing student who was a nurse encouraged me to sit down on the bed next to her as we talked. She was sitting up in bed. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've been in the habit of doing from then on. You know, I just hop into bed with people. That's fine. <laughs> Mr. Murphy, so forward. <laughs> well, you know, if somebody's sitting up in bed, sitting next to him, I think is a reasonable thing to do. And you know, there's some. Uh, there is an important part in the um, in the interview technique that supports that. You know, to, uh, if you don't know somebody very well and you're talking to them about sensitive things, it's uh, good to not be sitting directly across from them, like face to face, because it makes it difficult to avert eye contact. Um, so it makes it less confrontational if you're sitting next to each other? Yeah, or like, you know, 45 degrees or, or less or more, whichever direction we're talking about relatively. Yeah, yeah. Um, because that way people can look away without it being awkward. Mm. I suppose just saying at the beginning of the conversation, you're in no way obligated to maintain eye contact. In <laughs> fact, I discourage it. Look nah. at that! Yeah. That would probably make things awkward too. That nah, might weird people out a little bit. Mm. Well, it was worth a shot. If I'm ever a crazy old person with a nurse, I'll tell them that. Actually, if I'm ever a crazy old person with a nurse, I'll probably just spend the whole time comparing them unfavorably to you. <laughs> now my brother, he knew how to do things, practically invented your profession. <laughs> yeah, so I'm a regular Florence Nightingale, aren't I? <laughs> well, uh, I was indispensable during the war in the Falklands. Indeed you were. Everything blends together for kids. I'm sure I'll be able to trick them. It was the Great War. No, not that Great War, you young fool. <laughs> the Great War. Not the Great Cyber War. No. The Great Cyberpunk War. There were all those strobe lights everywhere. <laughs> and everybody had pince nez sunglasses. Ooh, I'm liking this war. 
Yeah, I'm really looking forward to inlays. I would love inlays. Mm. Just like display in for augmented reality data like right over your vision, that'd be great. <laughs> Starting to do it with phones, not really practically useful yet. In uh, one of the William Gibson books I just finished, uh, Zero History, that one, the one before it. Oh, um, as an art project, there was. Yeah, there was locative art as art projects. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Was that in the first one too? In. Um, no, it, I don't think it was in pattern recognition. Pattern recognition I think recognition, it was yeah. just in Zero History. Yeah, I I couldn't tell through most of the uh, the second two books that it was part of the same series that pattern recognition was in. It has the same main character, doesn't no, it? No, it does not. And really? the main character from Pattern Recognition only comes in at the very end of the third book. Oh. I could have sworn it was the same lady all yeah. the way through. Nope, it's a different person. Oh, I guess I need to reread that. Which one? Uh, well, all three of them, if I'm this confused. You've read all three of them? No, I read the first two. Oh, yeah. You know, the main character in the second one is not the same as the main character in the first one. Huh. Um, but the only clue about that is that... She has a different name. Really? Yeah, the main character of the second book is Hollis Henry, who was uh, in a band called The Curfew. Okay. The main character in the first book was not Hollis Henry, who was in a band called The Curfew. She had some different name, and she was uh, uh, she was in marketing and advertising. Wow, I didn't even notice that. I, I guess I just, part of my brain tuned out, and I assumed it was the same person, and I just forgot the name. I need to reread that then. I had a lot of really great ideas. It was like very, very good speculative fiction. And it was interesting because of our starting with pattern recognition, those books are a lot closer to present than a lot of... Than all of his other books. Yeah, yeah. so it's like more close range predict predictions, which I found interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much modern day. There's nothing that they talk about in there that's not like uh, not, not feasible uh, for... Technically for, possible. Yeah, that's not technically possible right now. I'm really enjoying getting uh, rereading re the Cryptonomicon. Um, I was uh, I thought that when I went to Borders and cleaned out their interesting books, <laughs> I thought that I had gotten another copy of Snow Crash and Diamond Age to lend a friend of mine, but I guess I did not pick those up because I you know I have a memory of buying them and putting them in the bag, but now they're nowhere to be found now. You didn't steal them, did you? I don't think so. Do you have your own copies of those books? I think I must. Hmm. Hard to say. Yeah, hard to say. Yeah. But it's weird to have very limited time now to do leisure activities. Because once I'm done with my charting, a lot of the time, you know, it's like too late to stay up and play video games or, or read a book or, you know, do any of that stuff. So I've actually found myself with several days of not having any time for, you know, any significant leisure activities. So hopefully charting in the field will help that, and then working a regular 9-to-5 schedule will help that, and having a regular caseload. Yeah, I, I, I've got to find some way to, like, make this a little more sane and manageable. Yeah, it's been almost a half hour now. Oh, wow. Yeah. You can just talk forever. I can, yeah. My YouTube account lets me upload uh, videos up to two hours in length. Really? I didn't know people could do that. Yeah, I don't know what made my account qualify, but um, my account qualifies for it. Maybe it's because I migrated over from uh, Google Video, and then Google Video shut down. So, I mean, that was pretty impressive. I thought that was going to be a big hassle, and a lot of other similar services... Wait for that to be finished. Uh, we we'll just uh, we we'll just offer you the option of downloading all of your videos. Uh -huh. uh, but um, Google Video had a one-button solution for just porting all of your Google videos over to YouTube, and that that was pretty impressive. Sounds convenient. Yeah. Yeah, there's some old videos in there, like. Um, uh, some little bits of demonstrations or breakout sessions that I recorded in nursing school. Um, there was a uh, role-playing assignment in nursing school that I did. Uh, there was a couple of different things. A lot of valuable insights for your biopic. Yeah, I guess. The Patrick Murphy saga. Well, I think I think this will be uh, more useful for that. Because, <laughs> uh, I mean, in those videos that I took in nursing school, I didn't appear in the videos. 
I was just, uh, excuse me, I was just recording. But, you know, for people generations from now trying to costume extras, it'll be very important. These yeah. references. Yes, yes. These historical reference points. Yes. Someday someone's going to be writing their theses on, you know, nursing practices in the early 2000s. And you will be a little known, but very valuable resource. Yeah, some, some researcher will posthumously fall in love with me, I'm sure. I've always wanted someone to posthumously fall, fall in love with me, but it's hard because I'm alive right now. Yeah, kind of uh, kind of makes that a little more difficult. Mm-hmm. I'm still try I'm still hedging my bets on the whole not dying thing. We'll see how that works. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm definitely holding out for immortality. I've never personally died. It all seems very unlikely and, you know, right, hypothetical yeah. to me. Yeah, there's no uh, there's no precedent for it. No precedent for me dying at all. Because I'm the point of view character. Yeah. And you've had a 100% success rate with living so far. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was patchy for a while, but yeah, yeah. Yes, you and your excess of Billy Rubin. Billy Rubin? Yeah, that's why you were yellow when you were a baby. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I always just refer to it as jaundice. There yeah. you go being all medical and technical. Well, I mean, jaundice is the correct term, but jaundice is, uh, jaundice is because of Billy Rubin. Billy Rubin. I, you know, I, I'm embarrassed because I can't explain to you exactly what it is. It was very important in anatomy and physiology. Um, and I, I, really, I really can't figure it out now. It's like some byproduct of metabolism that your uh, that your liver usually cleans out of you but if your liver's not working right it builds up it happens to baby sometimes yeah I had a lazy baby liver <laughs> yo lazy baby liver <laughs> which I predict this summer will become a popular insult in our nation's bars hmm. hopefully I really got to go back and reread my AMP textbook. It's really embarrassing that I don't, that I can't explain exactly what Billy Rubin is. I think part of it has to do with, um, you know, the last three years that I've spent uh, being specialized in uh, rehab and uh, end of life nursing. I don't really have a reason to use that info. All right. Well, that's it. <laughs>